then let's go and uh, let me first you know to welcome to all the participants to the security seminar and uh, and especially i will i would like to welcome as well the the two presenters that by the way one of them could not be presentially today here and and his speech is recorded and uh, the other one which is jonathan loosehouse and the other one uh, tobias vlog uh, who is going to be let me say participating to this session in the way that we are going to operate is that um, we are going to listen first the first presentation and then we will record and, and pick up your q a and obviously pass to jonathan in order that uh, in offline uh, he give us the answers and then we will try to reach or we will reach you to give you your answers because we will not be able to get it real time obviously because he's not present on the case of Tobias, uh, yes, I mean, he's going to be here and then we will have these uh, Q&A sessions and that will be a real event, uh, I mean, that we can we can take up today. Okay. The, so let's uh, go to start with the first presentation and a uh, few words about the presenter, Jonathan Loosehouse. He's director of the Human Cyber Criminal Project and senior research fellow in the Department of Soci Sociology of the University of Oxford. He is also a research fellow in the Newfield College and adjunct associate professor in UNSW Cambria Cyber. Jonathan research focus is uh, mainly focused on human side and as well the profit driven uh, driven cyber security or cyber crime. So mainly try to find out you know who are the cyber criminals and what are the organizationals behind. And he's a regular speaker, speaker in many conferences, so he had large experience to talk in, in conferences. And he's author as well to research uh, articles and uh, as well articles, for instance, the one that was in the, the Harvard University Press, like uh, calls for the industry anonymity inside the business of the crime published by the Harvard University, as was said. So I will propose that we move to the presentation. The presentation is called Inside the Business of Cybercrime. And uh, I wish you enjoy this first speaker. So I'm presenting on a talk today based on my academic research called Inside the Business of Cybercrime. Uh, it's a shame that I can't be there live for this event, but I'm very happy to engage with any questions uh, following this event at another point. And I hope uh, that it's, it's a very successful event. So, I, as I mentioned, I'm talking about this topic of cybercrime from the academic perspective, but I really am talking about it from a specific academic perspective, which is as a sociologist, as so someone who studies people. And so, what I'd like to start with is images of two particular cyber criminals. And these are two of the most important cyber criminals in the history of, of all of cybercrime, in my view. And why they're important is that they founded a website uh, almost decades ago now. So, we're talking about the early 2000s. And this website was called Carter Planet, and its function was to provide a location where cyber criminals could come together online, where they could trade, they could do business. Uh, the kind of well-known business that they were doing at the time was credit card fraud of, of different kinds, but they were involved in a whole range of different types of criminality. And in some sense, this website, Carter Planet, became a model for a lot of marketplaces that followed online. So we talk a lot now today about the dark net or the dark web, and what we're talking about here is 20 years ago. Uh, really like a prototype for this type of activity. And this was individuals who were rooted in certain cases, these two gentlemen, uh, Dmitry Golubov and, and Roman Vega. Uh, they were based in the Ukraine originally anyway, and uh, they were core members. But there was a network of people from across the region and also across the world who, who were getting involved in this. And it was highly professional. This was the kind of turning point for cybercrime, where not only did they trade various... Um, elements. So you're talking about trading credit card data, we're talking about trading services. They also had escrow systems, they had reputation systems, they had a system of vetting and vouching. And so it was very sophisticated in terms of trying to establish the, and protect the network. It's also a very famous case because a lot of the people involved in this actually met in person. So they met for a number of conventions in Odessa in the Ukraine. So basically like big meetings, business conferences, as you would in any other industry, they came together to discuss the state of the credit card fraud industry and broader cybercrime. And it was very important for them to, to be able to meet up uh, in person from time to time. So I'd like to introduce this so we see the kind of human angle of what we're talking about here when we begin talking about cybercrime. In terms of the evolution of cybercrime, 
this is something that over time has, has shifted from kind of, kind of amateur type of activity, one that was built more around fun, uh, messing around, not really heavily profit driven, but over time we get that emergence of a profit driven cyber criminal industry in my view. Uh, so we see in the 90s, uh, early cases starting to come into existence, but it's really the 2000s, Carter Planet is one example, but there's many others where we start to see offenders from around the world become increasingly successful, increasingly professional. And so this, in my mind, is the shift towards industrialization. That shift occurs because we start to put more and more things of value online. There's a lot more money floating around, there's a lot more data floating around in terms of uh, how we use the internet and, and other types of platforms. And this is because we're, we're seeing the value in that in terms of legitimate society. And as a result of that, we're creating more opportunity for people to try and compromise that data, to try and make money from, from theft, from fraud, from extortion, from a whole range of, of activities. And so what we see now, what we've seen over the past years from the 2000s up to the present is a process of, in, of increasing industrialization, of increasing sophistication and organization. And so the industry of cybercrime today is one that's highly specialized. We're seeing a whole range of different disciplines. There's a very clear division of labor. We have people who are very good at organizing. We have others who are, who are very technical. So that's one of the mistakes people make is assuming everyone involved in cybercrime is super technical, either a high level coder or, or a hacker or something like this. Actually, we see some people involved who are not particularly technical at all. They're good at organizing or they might be involved on the money side of things, which is an area where you need less of a technical skill set and more of a traditional criminal one in terms of how to manage the proceeds of crime. How do you launder money? How do you move money? How do you keep people uh, under your control, make sure that they're not going to run away with the money that is the, the sort of output of a lot of these cyber criminal schemes. So this is hugely important, this kind of uh, massive area, the massive number of, of specialties and subspecialties involved in cybercrime. And so as a result of that, you need people who are trained in those, in those particular skill sets, and that's very important. And so that's why you see a whole range of different people getting involved in cybercrime. It's not just one type of profile, it's, it's a number of different types of people and what we also see, as I mentioned before, is these types of marketplaces, which in some cases are very large. We're talking about up to thousands of members, in other cases, much smaller. And we, we also see operational groupings that I think look very much like firms. And in my view, are kind of like cyber criminal startups. These are groups of people who come together around a particular project or idea. There's a very strong technical focus in, in certain settings. And they're kind of doing exactly the same thing you'd expect someone to do in a, in a regular startup. It's just that they're, they're doing this for a criminal end. And often you're even seeing very similar types of people. So when I talk about being professional, we're seeing people who are highly educated, highly capable, and actually could work in legitimate industry if, if they wished. And sometimes they actually do. They move between the two or they have some kind of interests uh, at any one time, some of which are criminal and some of which are in the legitimate tech sector. So that's very important to note in terms of the threat that, that we're coming up against. So the core puzzle in terms of, of the research that I've done and that I find particularly fascinating is really trying to understand how this process of industrialization has taken place. When cybercrime seems to be a very low trust type of environment. So it's an environment where not only is everyone involved a criminal, so these are not the types of people you'd expect that they're trustworthy, that are gonna work well together. Uh, but also the bigger problem tied to that is that you don't necessarily know even who you're dealing with. So if you're working with someone online, how do you know who they are? How do you come to an agreement? How do you enforce that agreement? So what we're seeing is really a very interesting puzzle form. And this is the puzzle that's driven a lot of my research up to this point, which is how do cyber criminals collaborate with others in order to carry out illegal enterprises on an industrial scale? And so I'm trying to really pick that apart and, and talk you through that very quickly in this, in this short presentation. So what I did was actually travel around the world for about seven years, uh, interviewing 238 participants. These are people from law enforcement, from the tech sector who are tracking this type of stuff and former cyber criminals who are a very, very useful source of information in terms of that, that real detail and nuance of, of how this world works. So I went to 20 different countries. I tried to make sure that I went to a number of the hotspots, so places that are, that are known to have some association with cyber crime of, of one kind or another. So places like Ukraine, Russia, Romania, Nigeria, Brazil, and a number of other locations as well. And to really get a sense of the different flavors of cyber crime. So what was the local kind of variation or local specialization in terms of cyber crime that was coming out of some of these locations. So that was a, a huge part of my work to try and get to these different places and see what was happening on the ground. And so this in one slide, I'm going to try and sum up about seven years of work, uh, hopefully successfully, which is how do we solve this puzzle of, of these cyber criminals working together on this industrial scale? 
And so when I began this work, I thought, well, it's best to, instead of start from first principles, to actually just take what was known within academia already. So there's a huge literature within the social sciences on trust and on cooperation. And so I tried to, to draw on that, that knowledge rather than start again. And so one point that I looked at was the issue of trust. But what I discovered when I started doing research into this area was that the concept of trustworthiness was actually more valuable. So trust is kind of uh, an incorporation of a particular type of risk. And it's the risk that you don't know if the, the person on the other side of the bargain is going to live up to what they say. Trustworthiness is actually more relevant to these types of discussions, because what we're looking at is how do I assess whether this person is going to be less risky to deal with. And so those things are going to be really important. But when I did delve into the, both the theoretical literature and then also went and interviewed all these people around the world, what I discovered was that cyber criminals were far less innovative than, than we talk about. So we, we like to think of this as being a very fast moving dynamic area. They're coming up with all sorts of new stuff. But in reality, what I found was they were using the same kind of principles to uh, assess trustworthiness, to enhance cooperation as we do in, in the legitimate world. And so, you know, it's very well known to people. Reputation is, is one area that's, that's important. You like to work with people that you know something about them. You know what their track record is. You might have worked with them personally before. That's going to be very important in terms of, of deciding whether you want to continue working with such a person. And for cyber criminals, reputation is, is huge. It's very important to them to find someone that they, that they can work successfully with, that they have a good relationship with. And a lot of the interviews I did with former cyber criminals indicated that this was really key. If they found someone who, who was a good partner, they wanted to stick with them for, for as long as possible. You see other aspects of this uh, also relevant to trustworthiness in terms of performance, which is kind of like getting people to, to pass tests of one kind or another. So often they might start with a small type of business or trying to get someone to demonstrate their capability. And this will move to more significant tasks over time. And appearance is also quite important, but very difficult in cyber. Uh, because you can manipulate so many aspects of your appearance. But what I found is things like language, uh, whether you speak Russian, whether you speak English, the amount of time that you spend online, these are elements that are harder to kind of fake. And they, they're quite appealing to people. If you've been around in a community for a really long time, or I can sense that we have some type of cultural connection, that might play a role in, in someone appearing more or less trustworthy. So this is really important. The other part of this is, is enforcement. Um, this is not so much about whether we have trust for a particular individual, but actually there's a system in place where we think, okay, it's highly likely that the agreement will be honored uh, because we have maybe our own enforcement or we have an external enforcer, some sort of guarantor who can provide escrow or who can enforce the deal or provide some kind of dispute resolution if things go wrong. And cyber criminals actually have done this. They have a dispute resolu resolution function in, in certain forums and marketplaces. As I mentioned, they have escrow systems. But again, what they're doing, it's, it's very interesting um, and, and very effective, but it's, it's taking what's known in other aspects of human life and, and what's known to work in other aspects of human life and, and applying it to this particular cyber criminal setting. So the last substantive point I want to address quickly is just one of the solutions to the puzzle that I found was quite surprising, which is some of the cyber criminals actually were cheating in a sense that they were taking on this puzzle, not so much as one where we just are going to deal with people online, that this is the issue of dealing with online criminals, they decided, well, actually, I'll work with people I know in person. So I found a surprising number of cases where cyber criminals were working with people from their local community, or they knew uh, from their neighborhood, or they'd grown up with, went to school with, uh, or university with. And in other cases where they met people online, and then over time developed a kind of offline relationship. And this was actually very important for how they trusted each other and how they cooperated together. And it's something that we often don't think about. So I think it's important to mention that this is a kind of backdoor to getting very effective cyber criminal cooperation and getting to that, that level of industrialization that, that I'm talking about. In certain cases, what we've seen is, is whole you know, villages or, or areas where there's, there's really a strong sense of industry. So these types of cyber criminal startups as I'm referring to, you get some instances of people operating out of a physical office building. So they're operating very much at, at the most extreme form as a tech company. And that's what we're seeing in cybercrime. That's how sophisticated it's become. So to conclude very quickly, uh, I think we're talking about cybersecurity awareness here. So it's very important to be aware of the motivated and professional threat here. So what I've tried to explain in, in human terms, that these are people uh, and they're very effective and capable people, sometimes highly educated people who, who we might expect to see in the tech sector. We're kind of seeing a shadow industry, what I call a criminal Silicon Valley emerging, uh, where we're seeing this highly capable and organized uh, industry that is really the function of which is to, to attack and is to, to steal and to defraud and carry out these types of criminal activities. So that's very important to note because it tells us what we're up against. 
But what I think is the one kind of nice point, or in some sense that the value we can take out of that, which makes it less scary, is that as effective as they are, the other point I've been trying to make is that they're not as innovative as we think. So why they're effective is that, that if something works, they keep using it, they keep uh, evolving, they keep trying to improve their business, but they, it's much rarer for them to completely uh, have a kind of revolution to completely start and do something new. So it's much more a process of evolution. And as a result of that, what that means on the defense side is that if we can be serious about dealing with this threat, if we can be serious about trying to respond to it, uh, it's, it's actually about implementing the fundamentals in many cases. So coming up against this organized industry, it's about doing what we need to do in reverse rather than something that's much more complicated. And so that for me is, is a kind of silver lining here and something we should think about going forward in terms of trying to deal with this threat. So on that note, thank you very much and I hope you enjoy this event. Okay, we will pass over. Thank you to Jonathan. Um, please um, feel free to put some questions. Um, I copy three times, you know, these things. It was not intentionally, so I'm not so insistent. We'll assume as well that the research will be easy to find. Any further questions that we can take? We will try to find some of these, let me say, public articles and then in the reply we will put, you know, some of the links uh, that you have access. So I will ask, you know, Jonathan to pass some of this material as somebody was requested in the chat. Any wish, any other requirement? There is also a book available um, on this topic and uh, Professor Lustaus will be also available to, if there is a general interest to, to make another live session uh, with the bank. Okay, thank you, Monica. For the time being, let's, uh, let's at least, you know, retrieve some of this information to share with the colleagues that today participate and then we will see. Then, if that uh, it is on the first, uh, let me say, round of questions, I will say that we move to Tobias Viloch. Okay, maybe Tobias. Tobias, we are we have the pleasure to have Tobias with us today, and uh, I'm going to 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 your bio. Tobias Tobias Viloch works in the European Cybercrime Center at the Europol and leads the dark web team. The particular focus of the dark web team is investigations to dismantle organizations of crime groups operating in the dark marketplaces. In 2014, he built up this uh, this task or this group, and uh, and uh, to combat mainly with together with the international police uh, all this computer cyber creep at the Europol. This group mainly objective are to drive and to coordinate actions against uh, the key cyber crime threats. Before that, Tobias Biloch conducted cyber investigations at the German Federate Criminal Police. Tobias, the floor is yours and the title of the presentation will be European uh, Europol's Fights Against Cyber Crime. It was a very interesting uh, presentation from Jonathan. Um, now um, we will talk about uh, the economy of cyber crime and the Europol's fight against cyber crime. Um, first and foremost, thanks very much for the invitation uh, to the European Central Bank. Uh, very privileged to speak here today. Um, the European Central Bank is a valued and uh, trusted member of the European uh, Cybercrime Center's advisory groups, um, which we have a constant exchange with. And um, it's good to share our, our knowledge. And um, this is what I'm going to take. Um, up on here. Um, within the next 25, 30 minutes, I will talk about cybercrime and I will concentrate on the most nefarious threats of cybercrime. I'll talk about dark marketplaces, I'll talk about ransomware, I'll talk about carding and all those things. If that doesn't ring a bell to you, um, no worries. I'm going to go through it with you. I'll also give you an uh, outlook of the most um, uh, yeah, nefarious trends that we see in, in cybercrime. And if there's one takeaway from this presentation uh, that I would like you to remember is that um, no one can fight cybercrime on its own. And I will also take up on this quote uh, during my presentation and you will see it. So let's jump right into it. And what is better to start with than a concrete example that we had. And as you can see here, there's a press release from Europol 
that we published yesterday and uh, resulted in an arrest of 150 targets that we were able to identify. It. And these targets were vendors, mostly drug vendors, operating on one of the largest dark marketplaces called Dark, uh, dark Market. And this marketplace was taken down earlier this year. And what we did with this operation is that we concentrated on the so-called high value targets. These are the vendors, the drug vendors. And as you can see here on the right hand side, also a few numbers of um, the drug seizures that we had and also the cash and virtual currency seizures that we had uh, in the course. Needless to say that this operation is not finished yet. Uh, we were still working on other targets and uh, go through them one by one. This was just a spotlight on those targets that we considered um, the most nefarious ones. The countries that took part in this operation is um, are Australia, Bulgaria, France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Switzerland, uh, the UK, and uh, various agencies uh, from the United States. So it would be wrong to take all the praise. Uh, the praise goes mostly to the law enforcement agencies um, of those involved uh, countries. So let's go to the next slide. And what you can see here is a press release that I just mentioned. This is the takedown of dark marketplace called dark market. What you see on the right hand side is a so called seizure banner. So this marketplace was taken down um, beginning of this year and then it took us eight months roughly to work on the targets to prepare them to identify them to work with the agencies to coordinate it. And um, that also resulted then in the action of 150 arrests. It's not always easy. Um, it takes a long time, but um, we eventually were very successful. And what you can also see on the seizure banner, it's in German language because the operation was run by um, the uh, German police. And uh, below, which is a little bit blurred out, is the English text. And then you can see also the agencies uh, that were involved in this operation. So when you talk about a dark marketplace um, and how big a dark marketplace is, I listed up some figures for you. And um, this dark marketplace had uh, 500,000 registered users. And out of those 500,000 registered users, there were buyers and sellers. There were like 2,400 sellers and over 300,000 transactions. Um, that is quite a lot. And these marketplaces are actually very high in demand. And they are also built up like a normal marketplace, as you would see on Amazon or eBay. And the reason why it is, is because it's, it replicates those marketplaces or it also replicates the shopping experience. You can search for all kinds of illegal commodities or illegal services, uh, whatever you're interested in. So if you think about where's a place to buy drugs, weapons, explosives, it's the darknet and it's specifically dark marketplaces. You can also buy all other illegal commodities on, on forums, on image boards, on card shops, and various other things, but it's mostly on dark marketplaces. And the most important question is actually not only where can you buy these things, it is more important to think about where do criminals get educated? You don't wake up and say like, okay, today I will become a cyber criminal. It's more like a process. So you start from a young age and then you develop. But where do you get your knowledge from? And this is the dark web. And if you're a successful criminal, then you might end up as a vendor on one of these dark web marketplaces. And that's why we put so much effort into, in, into it uh, to not only uh, take down these marketplaces, but also to identify the users. What are dark marketplaces? Um, you can picture it um, as the surface web and um, the deep web and the dark web. So the surface web is everything that you probably use in your daily life. So you use your client, which can be uh, Mozilla Firefox or Chrome or, or Safari, and you search on the internet, on the clear web, whatever you want. And then there's the deep web. These are pages that are not indexed by Google, but they are also there. And then there's the dark web, and this is an area that you can only access uh, with a special um, client that's a Tor browser. You can also only access these marketplaces with the help of this Tor browser. Now, the criminals use that because these kind of domains are so-called onion domains, and the hosting location is um, not visible or very, very hard to identify, almost impossible to identify. 
But before we go into some of the threats, uh, let me just quickly show you how the Cybercrime Center is built up. So, and the areas that we are responsible for. So you have uh, payment fraud, you have high-tech crime, you have child sex for exploitation, you have a cyber intelligence area, and then the dark web area. And um, that is uh, my team running these investigations and operations. Let's talk about some high profile attacks. So again, I can talk for hours about cybercrime, but I only concentrate on the, on the high profile attacks. So we had a recent attack in Germany where a ransomware um, attacked a hospital and um, not only encrypted data, but also encrypted uh, server infrastructure. So this gets very serious because you might think that, okay, you can't access patient's data anymore. That is severe on its own. But if it also access um, the communication of machines that keep people alive, that it can then can get very life threatening. And this is also a very serious case. Another case that we worked on <clears throat> was a cyber attack on SolarWinds, um, an energy provider that was also the beginning of this year. And another case that you might know from the press is the ransomware attack on the Colonial Pipeline. Uh, what does all these attacks have in common apart from the fact that ransomware was dropped? All these attacks happened on critical infrastructure. Now, if you get infected by a malware and your personal computer is affected and your file are encrypted and you can't access your family photos or any sensitive documents, sensitive personal documents that you have on your laptop, that is not nice. If you have a backup, <clears throat> that's good. Um, but that's, let's say you can't access those family photos. And that is, that is not so nice. But if um, IT infrastructure is encrypted and you can't communicate anymore and uh, it's critical infrastructure, then it's getting very serious. And it can also happen with um, uh, various other sectors. So I just, so critical infrastructure is divided in, in the healthcare sector, in the financial sector, in the energy sector, in the uh, transportation sector, and so on. So let's imagine a big bank or a few banks are attacked with a ransomware and you uh, as a customer on a Monday morning can't conduct any con transactions anymore because it's not possible. The effect that would result in is chaos. So we don't want this to happen. So <clears throat> our job is to um, identify those criminals, go after the infrastructure and um, also stop those ransomware payments. Here's one of the latest successes that we have. Um, uh, two members that were arrested in the Ukraine. You can see that the press release is from the 4th of October, uh, where we worked very cl cl closely with the uh, French authorities and the Ukrainian authorities in collaboration with the US FBI. And uh, that resulted also in two arrests and um, two uh, search uh, seven search warrants. Now you might think like, okay, two arrests, um, that's actually not that much if you talk about ransomware. And I just mentioned 150 arrests. But if those two are administrators and responsible for spreading malware uh, through the whole of Europe and the US, then it's quite a big deal to arrest two individuals. <clears throat> now, let's talk a little bit about um, how a cyber criminal is operating. And I would like to take you on a small journey with me. And most people ask me to be as what is cybercrime as a service and how has cybercrime developed and how has it specialized? And I would like to give you a concrete example. So you have a cyber criminal and this is in the middle of this chart. And this cyber criminal is, let's say he's 14 years old, he's unexperienced. He would like to conduct a cybercrime attack and let's take maybe a ransomware attack, but he has zero knowledge. And this is something that we see very often that somebody is not very knowledge knowledgeable but he can actually buy every service that he wants. He has to pay for it, of course, but he has to buy every service and he doesn't need to have the knowledge. So let's say he's looking for a specific uh, piece of malware. Where is he going to buy it? He's going to buy it on an underground forum or any other communication platform. Now he has this piece of malware, but he doesn't know if this piece of malware is actually uh, worse uh, or what is worse. Is it actually possible to deploy it or not? So he has it tested against a so-called counter antivirus service. This is CAV, counter antivirus service. So these are services that are offered in the underground economy and you can upload and test your malware against common antivirus services. So see if it's been detected or not. If it's not been detected, 
if it's more it's more worse and then more success of um, and, and you have a higher success rate of deployment. Uh, but what else? You would need a botnet to spread your malware because you don't want to infect one machine. You want to have a, a wide reach. You want to affect multiple machines. Maybe you want to even target critical infrastructure. Maybe you want to target big corporations, not even the end user, but big corporations that might pay you uh, a ransom. Um, that could be possible. And therefore, you need an infrastructure. Um, BPH stands for Bulletproof Hosting. Bulletproof Hosting is um, an internet and service provider that um, provides you various servers and also uh, infrastructures to uh, spread your malware. Uh, those kind of services um, very often don't lock any details and they also don't like to work with law enforcement. So it makes it harder for us uh, to get uh, on the bottom of uh, identifying or dismantling that infrastructure. And then you want to attack your banks. Uh, but you don't want to attack only one bank, you want to attack multiple banks. So you have various identifiers here, and you are the cyber criminal, and you are in the middle, and again, uh, you are not very knowledgeable. And for us, it's very often, that goes for every criminal case, it's like solving a puzzle, and you have a piece of a puzzle everywhere, but even more, that goes for cybercrime cases. So let's take this example. You have a malware on an underground forum that was designed, let's say, by a Russian speaking individual in Eastern Europe. And I'm taking here a random example. Okay. And this malware is using an IT infrastructure that's been hosted in Germany, France, and the Netherlands. And the malware itself attacks bank, banks in the US and the UK. And there you go. That's your classic cybercrime case. And this is what we deal with on a daily basis. And every cybercrime investigator will definitely assure you that is a normal cybercrime case. You will very rarely find a case where you have a Dutch individual that is operating with a Dutch infrastructure and only targets Dutch banks. Uh, that is um, what I have not seen uh, so far in my career. And then at the end, you also need mules. You need money mules because you also want to cash out your funds. But again, all those services you can buy. You can buy the malware, you can buy um, the botnet, you can buy the infrastructure, uh, you can uh, pay the money mules. Um, and then eventually hide your traces. All these identifiers need to be brought together, and that is being done at Europol and the JCAT, the Joint Cybercrime Action Task Force. That is here at Europol and consists of dedicated law enforcement officers uh, from various um, countries and uh, their cybercrime uh, units. So let's talk about some challenges that we have in uh, fighting cybercrime. And no worries, I'm not trying to educate you here as a um, dark web investigator, but just to make you aware of what kind of challenges we deal with and why does cases take eight months for preparation until they come into action. So I start clockwise and I start with the loss of data that we have. So every European country has a different data retention. Um, data not, might not be there anymore. If an attack happens later than a year or you get data that is later than a year or a hard drive that you need to evaluate and need to analyze and there's data on there, um, that is older than a year, then it makes it much harder for us uh, to get maybe subscriber information on an email address or a telephone number. Uh, criminals also work with encryption. If we get a data set, it doesn't mean that it's um, decrypted. Uh, we might need to encrypt it, uh, we might do decrypt it first, and that can take uh, maybe days, weeks, months. Um, depends on the encryption, on the level of encryption. Criminals also work with cryptocurrencies. They don't use their bank accounts, that would be good for us, but that would be very stupid for a criminal. So I use cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin is only the most prominent one, um, but there are loads of other cryptocurrencies, and especially those ones with a very high privacy component that are being used by cyber criminals. Then criminals itself, they operate on the dark web, as I said before. They try to hide their hosting location, so we have a loss of location. We don't know where to start. We don't know where the legislation is. Then uh, we work uh, in a public-private uh, corporation and in partnerships. So Europol doesn't claim that we have knowledge of all the data. Uh, it's actually the opposite. We need to work with private industry partners. If you think of, um, for instance, credit card details that are being sold online, um, that is victim data that we don't know if that is valid or not. That can only be, be verified by the banks or by the card sheets. Uh, so that's why we also need to work with uh, private industry partners very closely and also with academia. 
As I said before, no one can fight cybercrime on its own. Also, every other country has uh, different legal frameworks, different legislations that we need to respect. We have um, an MLA process, a mutual legal assistance process that is in place that we try to harmonize. But again, it's still cross-border and we also need to respect uh, different legislations of other countries. And then also the last point, we need to train ourselves. Uh, cybercrime modus operandi are constantly evolving and crime will never disappear. It will always develop and we need to adapt to it. Here are some of the key as aspects and uh, assets that we have at Europol. So that's first and foremost our expertise um, what it may be in analyzing data sets. Uh, we are very knowledgeable on um, big data. Um, on decryption, for instance, uh, we provide operational support, on the spot support. If any country plans an operational action, we have the data storage. We can we have a large database where we run our identifiers through and create cross match reports. We have the network. We have the liaison bureaus, so we can reach out to any law enforcement agency that Europol has an operational agreement with. That can be a European country, but that can also be a third party country. Let's say. Canada, the US or Australia, for instance. And we also provide the secure exchange. So as a police agency, we communicate with other police agencies uh, on a very secure exchange and make sure that that's operational data that we exchange is not going to get lost. But only to give an idea of what Europol is doing and um, how we conduct our operations. What is also very interesting for us is the type of cyber threats that we deal with. So what is the motivation somebody is um, doing a, an attack? It is very often, you might think, is very often financially motivated. And it might be also an organized crime group. But also very often, we don't know if it's an organized crime group. As I showed before, um, when you saw the cyber crime as a service example, crime as a service example, you can buy all these services. So Criminals don't need to know each other. They just need to buy the service in. And actually, this model also developed as ransomware as a service or hacking as a service. If you look at the administrators of dark marketplaces, we had in the past uh, Wall Street markets, one of the biggest dark marketplaces that was taken down. The three administrators, they are running into the uh, court proceedings right now. They haven't physically never met before. They only operated online. And if you talk about dark marketplaces, that's like a minimum trust environment. So you need to generate this trust. You need to build up your username and you need to, um, yeah, you need to communicate a lot. And that doesn't, and trust doesn't come overnight. But we also have um, hacktivists, we have insiders, um, we have um, criminals that are politically motiv motivated. So all that is important to do our threat assessment and also to get uh, to the bottom of this case and uh, eventually uh, put all the pieces of puzzles together, connect the dots and try to see the bigger picture. So this is uh, one of the um, other actions uh, that we had that I just want to quickly highlight. Um, we not only try to do or help um, agencies and operational actions, but we also try to get um, to a stage where we say, okay, we do something on a preventive side before a crime happens. And then this carding action, there's also a press release from last year, we were able to identify 90,000 pieces of uh, credit card details that were not for sale on dark web forums yet. So we were able to identify servers where those um, credit card, de card details were hosted. And we very closely worked with the um, card teams together in order for them to provide these details um, uh, to their um, to their uh, fraud uh, units and identify the customer and then also notify the customer, uh, block the card or flag any future transactions. So we try to get actually to the point before a cyber, cyber crime happens. And therefore, we need to work very closely with private industry partners. But this is just another example of our cooperation. Let's go into the trends and um, I'm also coming to the end of the presentation. These are the key findings from the IOPTA 2020 that you see here. The IOPTA is the Internet Organized Crime Threat Assessment. Um, these are only the trends that um, I wanted to highlight. There is loads of more trends that we saw, and it's also from last year. 
because the new iOcta for 2021 is not out yet. It will be released very shortly, beginning of November. Keep your eyes peeled. The uh, members of our advisory group, they will get a copy uh, before the official release date. And um, here I just highlighted for you uh, some of the trends that we see. So that we always say what we've said um, for the past years that ransomware will remain a dominant threat um, and uh, that also um, social engineering is uh, one of the things that uh, criminals use. If they can't overcome uh, technical uh, measures implemented by companies, they will always rely on social engineering. And what we also see is that life cycles of uh, dark web marketplaces have shortened. Um, that is due to law enforcement work. We've taken down these marketplaces and new marketplaces are constantly popping up. But again, the life cycle is uh, are rather shortened. Let's have a quick outlook uh, for you on the trends that we see in uh, 2021 and also in the years coming that are highlighted here for you. It's a little bit exclusive. So again, the iOcta 2021 will come out. It's, uh, you can download it, it's, it's for free. It's uh, nothing uh, that is um, uh, confidential. Um, it's, instead, we actually would like to educate uh, European citizens. And uh, here you can see some of the trends. So again, ransomware will remain uh, one of the uh, most nefarious threats, um, specifically those kind of ransomwares that uh, targets uh, third party providers as they also create a potential significant uh, damage uh, for other organizations, uh, specifically in the supply chain and also in the critical infrastructure. The ransomware attacks that we have seen last year and this year, they will certainly increase and um, they will also target other organizations. It's for us not a matter of if organizations are being targeted, but when. Also, what we will see is that cryptocurrencies will continue to facilitate payments um, for various forms of cyber crimes and specifically those ones that are privacy orientated uh, crypto coins, but also um, decentralized exchange services and so on. Some of the coins that we saw over the years and are also popping up and will be continuous, uh, for instance, Monero, Dash or Zcash, those are kind of coins that are predominantly used by cyber criminals. And what you find now is marketplaces that only accept Monero, for instance, as method of payment and not Bitcoin anymore. Uh, criminals will also migrate uh, to other businesses, uh, specifically uh, encrypted communication apps, um, because the user interaction is much more direct and also they can hide their location, they can act more anonymous, um, they can instantly get a feedback on what they need, whatever it is. If they need some credit card details or maybe compromised login credentials, they can easily buy it. And uh, it, it's not only dark marketplaces anymore, it's uh, also Telegram channels, for instance. We definitely can see and we will see the decrease of large scale marketplaces. Um, marketplaces that are popping up will be taken down quicker and it also makes harder for criminals. Um, we heard earlier from Jonathan that reputation plays a big role for cyber criminals and so does for vendors. In this minimum trust environment, you need to build up your reputation. If you want to be a so-called power seller, you also need to have a lot of feedback. You need to have a lot of good reviews in order for customers to buy from you. And uh, what we also see that uh, people will rely on those kind of uh, customers that um, are buy very often. And the customers will rely on those kind of vendors that have only a high rating of positive feedback. What we will also see is uh, in terms of dark marketplaces, we will see uh, wallet-less marketplaces. We will see uh, user-less marketplaces. So these are the kind of things that makes it harder for us. Um, and it doesn't make our life easier, but we are definitely, uh, we're definitely on it and, um, and uh, try to conduct our investigations. As I said before, um, nobody can fight cybercrime on its own. We work with the private sector. Um, we work on the internet governance side. We work with academia, institutional partners. And of course, our main important partners are the law enforcement agencies. All these partners together will help us to fight cybercrime and also for, will help us to fight cybercrime on a sustainable level and uh, not only for the snapshot. Here are some of the prevention campaigns uh, that I listed up and um, then I'm already coming to um, the end of my presentation and the last slides. 
Um, we try to educate European citizens. Uh, what is money muling? Uh, how can you prevent um, sexual online sexual harassment? Um, how can you do safe online shopping? Um, what you need to um, take into consideration for mobile malware, for instance, uh, those kind of things that we try to uh, reach um, the public and try to raise awareness and try to educate them. Uh, one of the most successful um, campaigns that we had is uh, the No More Ransom campaign uh, that I listed here up for you. So victims that are infected with ransomware, they can either upload uh, um, the uh, files themselves or the ransomware node and then see if there's a decryption key and um, that will help them to decrypt their data. We had um, a lot of successes. I mean, that also you can see from the numbers uh, for now, I think we started with a very low numbers of partners, but it increased and now we have uh, 140 partners. We have um, the website available in several languages. There are several tools, there are several decryption keys. So we helped a lot of victims. Um, it doesn't mean that we can help all of the cases, but we try to help a lot of the cases. And this is the last slide of my presentation. That is what we are also trying to do is to raise awareness in the public. So if you're buying on the dark web, be aware because what you're buying uh, might be fake. And also uh, if you're dealing specifically on dark marketplaces, you're operating with criminals, mm -hmm. you work in this zero trust environment and their criminals have their data. And for sure, if they find an opportunity to rip off you, you and your data, they will certainly go for it. So with that, I showed you some of the trends um, that we see in cybercrime, some of the prevention campaigns that we did, some of the actions that we conducted. And I hope you have any questions. Uh, if you have, um, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Thanks very much for your attention. Mm -hmm.